I was I got to face <laughs> of the time person of the year, but I was only one face representing many many yeah, people yeah, yeah. as it was the Ebola fighters, which included all of those people in our hospital, That's from the true. doctors and nurses to the janitors and the cashiers, yeah, yeah, and it yeah. took that entire community to fight Ebola, and and I think it was. It was an honor to be counted among them. That is great achievement. So everyone who, who wants to set up a question, just do not hesitate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, as for how it felt, the disease itself was terrifying and painful and, and terrible, awful. <laughs> um, to, to survive, um, you know, there, are, there were 11,300 people who died in West Africa. There are nearly 15,000 survivors now of this outbreak. And uh, I think it's very important that the medical community recognize that these survivors are unique. They have a problem that, that the medical community has not, never learned how to manage. And so uh, I, I encourage you, maybe you won't see Ebola survivors in Macedonia, but you might. Or you might travel to a place where there are survivors. And I encourage you to not place a stigma on them as someone who, who had this terrible disease, but to treat them with compassion, recognizing the trauma they've been through. Dr. Brindley, can you tell us something about your new book and what about uh, is in that book? My wife and I wrote a book. And the title is Called for Life. How Loving Our Neighbor Led Us Into the Heart of the Ebola Epidemic. Um, it was published in America. I think it's going to be published in Germany. Uh, and it is, it is our story. It's, it's much more detail about the story I just told, but it also tells about who we are and where we come from and why we were doing what we did in, in Liberia. Uh, and we told we f we felt a real responsibility to share our story, because uh, we think that it it can have uh, an effect to to encourage people. It's a it's an encourage it's a good story. I live. <laughs> Don't let me ruin the ending. I live. Um, but it also can challenge people, like the challenge I've just offered to you, to remember to choose compassion over fear, and. Um, we also hope that it will, will give people some difficult questions to wrestle with, because I think that's important for us to do, is to find the difficult questions in life and wrestle with them. It's available on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> I have also one question, maybe two. First of, of it is, what is World Health Organization doing for, for, for stopping Ebola virus? Because as far as I got, in Western Africa, either Samaritan per, Purse is, is present or uh, Doctors Without Borders, but not official stuff of the other World Health Organizations. Why is that? We enjoy so doing only statistics or? That was true at the beginning of the outbreak. You know, historically, over the last 30 years, Whenever there was an Ebola outbreak in Africa, it was always in Eastern or Central Africa, and Doctors Without Borders, or MSF, was always the organization to come in and contain the outbreak and treat the patients. And they were very good at it, and they have been successful at containing every outbreak in the past, and the outbreaks have gotten smaller over time because of their, their management. And at the beginning of this outbreak, Doctors Without Borders came in, and I think the World Health Organization looked 
They saw a small number of cases. They saw that Doctors Without Borders was there, and they said, it's under control. They'll, they'll control it just like they did every other outbreak. But there were a lot of factors about this outbreak that were unprecedented. Uh, it had never occurred in West Africa before, so the people in West Africa were totally unfamiliar with it. And it occurred in a tri-border region between three countries. And so it spread into three different countries run by different governments with different ministries of health and different health care system structures. And, and there was a lot of fear and superstition in the cultures there about what was really happening. And, and I think the World Health Organization failed to realize those factors that were going to make this unlike any previous outbreak. So they have, they have said, the World Health Organization has said they dropped the ball at the beginning of this outbreak. But when the international community recognized what was happening, when the United States of America and the United Kingdom, Great Britain, and, and other countries began to engage in this fight, um, it, was, it was in partnership with the World Health Organization. And, and I was honored, privileged to attend the World Health Assembly last year in Geneva. And the entire conversation for that entire conference of two weeks, every, every conversation came back to Ebola because it was informing every other conversation about every other topic. And I think the World Health Organization has, has changed the way they respond to disasters uh, because of this experience. And the second, if you can just give a short insight about how the drug has been developed, that short story. Mm. The one I told you. Yeah. The, the story of this drug, ZMAP, is amazing. It's a monoclonal antibody. It's actually three monoclonal antibodies combined together. And the science behind this, this medication is built on the shoulders of seven Nobel Prizes in science. You see, first they had to take the virus and expose a mouse to the virus. And then they isolated the mouse's antibodies against the virus. They, they isolated the antibodies and they broke down the proteins of the antibody to find out what gene sequ sequence would make that antibody. Then they synthesized that gene sequence. They created it synthetically and put it in a virus. They used that virus to infect a certain kind of bacterium. And, and as it infected the bacterium, the bacterium incorporated that new synthetic gene into its own DNA. Then they took tobacco plants, a certain kind of tobacco plant that is especially susceptible to this bacteria. And they, they submerged the tobacco plant in a solution containing this bacteria. And then they drew a vacuum on that solution on that they put it in a vacuum and the plant takes up the solution then they turn off the vacuum and the bacteria stay inside the plant and they infect the plant and they incorporate their genome into the plant's genome and then the plant begins to produce the proteins that are now part of the genes in its dna and those proteins are the heavy chain and the light chain of the antibody then I guess we all came from the same primordial sludge, and why wouldn't we have the same mechanics? But the plant makes these proteins, and they get put together into the antibody. And then they process the, the plants, they, they mulch them up, they purify the plant and extract the antibody. And not only did they, they come up with this therapy, but it was collaboration between scientists in the United States and scientists in Canada, they shared their data. They, they gave up their rights to their own discovery and patents because they said, together we could do something better for people who need this drug. So let's share our information and see if together we can, we can make something better than what either one of us is making on our own. And they did. And it's that kind of humility and collaboration that, that ultimately brought about the end of this outbreak. Not just from those scientists, but from the international community. People being willing to work together across international borders and international boundaries, across, across different faiths, partnering together 
to do what is good for, for people in need. And I think that speaks to the heart of the profession of medicine and what we are called to do as physicians. Wait. There is some question out there. Um, they, they created that drug and they used it in trials. They treated some patients in America as well as a trial in West Africa. Unfortunately, they stopped that trial because they saw that the, the risks were not outweighing the benefits. Um, so in theory, that short interrupting RNA, it may have a place in the future treatment of Ebola and other diseases. Um, I think that drug itself taught us a lot, but is not, not the answer for this disease. The, if you found yourself in a similar situation like this one, would you do anything differently? Hmm. That's a very good question. I want to answer it in more than one way. So if you, if you ask me, or if, if you were there beside me when I went to hold that woman's hands, and if you were to say to me, stop, if you hold her hand, you're going to get Ebola, would I, would I do anything different? Yes. I would not have intentionally exposed myself. If someone had said, stop, that's, that's the point where you're going to get Ebola, of course I wouldn't have done that. But if, if you ask me, do I regret the experience and do I wish I had never engaged in treating patients with Ebola, then the answer is no. I don't regret it, and I hope that if I were in the same situation, I would do it again. Because I, I, I was in Liberia because I felt a call from God on my life to serve Him by serving people in need. That's what took me to Liberia in the first place. And how could I abandon them in the time of greatest need when, when a disaster strikes there? I think that's... I think what it means to love your neighbor as yourself, you know, if it was your child, you would be moved with compassion and concern for your child, without a doubt. I think to love your neighbor as yourself is to recognize the suffering of others and react with the same compassion you would have for your own child because they are a, a human being made in the image of God who deserves love and compassion and care. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, by the time when the epidemic was going on, we have one case in Macedonia, in Skopje, and uh, one person was announced as suspicious for Ebola. A great panic was created at that time. One hotel was uh, in quarantine for several days, and finally the, they realized it is not Ebola, but in the world, they say, a possible case in Macedonia, maybe something like that. So, uh, this story about uh, uh, the drug is incredible. It's, it actually it is a serotherapy with antibodies, but because the reservoir is very large, bats are main reservoir for this uh, type of viruses, and uh, only, only real control and prevention would be effective vaccine. Are there some uh, studies going on about vaccine or not? Because companies are not so much interesting to produce good vaccines. They are interesting to sell expensive drugs. And this <laughs> drug is maybe, this is not drug. This is actually serotherapy with antibodies. Probably is very expensive. <coughs> so in English, we have a saying, I don't know if you have something similar in Macedonian, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. A little bit of prevention is worth a lot of cure. And I think that's very true, and you make a very good point 
about Ebola, that it's great to develop therapies like the short interrupting RNAs and the antibody serums, but those are not the solution. The solution is prevention. And there were several companies actually that did produce vaccines and put them into trial in West Africa. And some of those, a couple of those have shown uh, promise and they're still analyzing the data. I read in the news that these two new cases in Guinea, they immediately started vaccinating all of the known contacts with one of these experimental vaccines. Um, and, and so those studies have been promising that they may be on the verge of a, of a effective vaccine. The next question will be, to whom will they give it and how will it be distributed? And those questions are above my pay grade. <laughs> but, um, but I think your point is, is well taken. And I, this outbreak brought a lot of attention to a disease that would have otherwise been neglected. And so a lot of money was poured in by the United States and lots of other countries into Ebola research. And in fact, one of the debates now in the United States is the money that's left over that was supposed to be allotted for Ebola research, should we, should we stop that and now use the same money to, to research Zika virus? Because it's the, it's the headline disease of the week. Um, it, it's a very complicated system. Uh, and, and there are a lot of motivating factors for a lot of entities when it comes to creating new medications and drugs for diseases that only affect people in poor countries. But I think that's why it's important to recognize that diseases like Ebola and Zika, they don't only affect people in poor countries. They affect people around the world. And, and it, is, it is to the benefit of all of us to be concerned about the well-being of the few of us. That's why I go back to saying that we have an obligation to the weak and vulnerable among us. Not only is it our obligation to do good for them, but as we do good for them, it, we will reap the benefits of that as well because their vulnerability is our vulnerability. Um, I have a question. For example, if this type of disease happens in the United States, uh, how will the United States government on, in their health system deal with this disease? Because you have the top hospitals, top laboratories. Would you handle it better than this in Africa? Uh, How are you prepared? So there were two cases of Ebola transmitted in America. Um, we had a, a man who traveled from Liberia to the United States in September or October of 2014, and, and then he developed Ebola. He had contracted it in Liberia, but then he didn't get sick until he was in America. And two of the nurses who took care of him, they contracted the disease. Um, so that, that taught us one thing. That taught us that from a prevention standpoint, America is not immune to problems. But we also saw that our health system is such that we did not have a big outbreak because of that one case. Um, just the public health infrastructure is totally different than, than the public health infrastructure in West Africa. What we also saw is that I think there were 11 cases of Ebola treated in the United States. The two nurses were the only ones who contracted it there. There were two others, the man from West Africa and a doctor who was returning from service in West Africa, who were both diagnosed in America. And then the remainder of us were people who were diagnosed in West Africa and then transported back for treatment. But of those 11 cases, there were only two deaths. So a less than 20% uh, mortality rate compared to 45 or 50 percent that we saw in West Africa. So it, it's the health systems make a very big difference in in the spread of disease and in the treatment of disease. Question from over there. I did. I told you that I received three blood transfusions, including one from a survivor. And when I was back in America, after I had recovered, um, in the month of October, there were four cases. There was a, a, a journalist from America who got Ebola in Liberia. There was 
my my friend and mentor, Dr. Rick, who who came to Liberia after I got sick because he said, Kent and Nancy, my other colleague, said Kent and Nancy got Ebola and and are being brought back to America. I have to go take their place and keep the hospital running because we can't let the hospital shut down or people will die of all sorts of other things besides Ebola. So he came to Liberia and after a couple of weeks, he ended up contracting Ebola in the hospital. Um, and then there were the two nurses also in, in Dallas who contracted Ebola from the patient from West Africa. And miraculously, those four, the two nurses, Dr. Rick and the, the journalist, they shared the same blood type with me. And so I was able to donate plasma for all four of them. But it was nothing that, I did nothing that had not already been done for me. Well, first of all, uh, I would like to say thank you for sharing with us your touching, emotional, and at the same time, very motivational story of yours. And I would like to ask you, uh, how important was really for you at that moment when you were struggling, fighting the disease, to believe in yourself, strongly believe in yourself, that you can be successful and that you can be the ball? Um, that is a very interesting question. Because the truth is, I didn't really believe in myself and I wasn't convinced that I was going to beat Ebola. But despite that fact, I had tremendous peace in the midst of that situation. And it wasn't because I was convinced that I would live. It's because I was convinced that what I was doing was right. And so even if I died, God granted me peace to know that even if I died, I was, I was living in a way that was faithful to Him. And that what was, that's what was most important not life or death. Um, and, and I'd love to talk to you more about, about that peace and, and what it means to have that peace despite your circumstances. We have seen a drop in the mortality rate, a decrease in the mortality rate as the epidemic went on. So the mortality rate near the end of the epidemic was much lower than it was at the beginning. It all averaged out to about 45 or 50 percent. Um, I think some of the lessons we learned in treating patients in America and in some European countries really did impact our care of patients with Ebola in, in West Africa. And so I think there have been improvements in that care. I am. I, my doctors at Emory University Hospital are engaged in research along with the American Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And they draw my blood uh, every few months to continue, uh, continue their research. They're really, they're really doing some very remarkable research, not just related to Ebola, but they're learning things about the human immune system that they have never been able to test before. And, they're hoping to learn even to control or influence or, or modulate cellular immunity, which is really remarkable. I don't understand it all, but I give them my blood and they, they run the tests. So. Uh, do you think that it is possible that our body could develop an immunity to Ebola? Well, so having lived through the disease, I have immunity to that strain of Ebola. There are six strains of the virus. I am now immune to Ebola Zaire. Uh, but what we know is that it is not lifelong immunity. Uh, it wanes over time. Um, I, there are interesting case studies in West Africa of individuals who never appeared to be sick, but they show immunity to the virus. And so that raises a lot of questions about did they develop immunity and never get sick, or did they have a subclinical course? Or what? Uh, there's a lot of uh, investigation going on around how to take care of survivors, but also how does this disease work, and what are the factors that allow a person to live or 
result in them dying from the disease. And how long is lasting that well, I'll continue donating blood to find out. Uh, According to the last question from uh, my colleague Tamara, I, I want to ask you why the official, officials uh, choose exactly the Emory Hospital for the curing process? Emory volunteer, well, Emory University Hospital has a serious communicable diseases unit, SCDU, um, where they, they have developed this unit over the last 12 or 13 years in, in collaboration with the Center for Disease Control because the CDC is just down the street from Emory University Hospital. They're very close to, together. And so they've partnered together to develop this unit hoping to have a place to treat any CDC employees who might contract a serious communicable disease when they're going to places like West Africa to respond to Ebola outbreaks or to China to respond to a SARS <coughs> outbreak. Um, so that was the purpose behind creating that unit. So they have never treated a patient in that unit with a serious communicable disease. They had only treated two patients in 12 years and both of them turned out to not have the disease they, they suspected. Um, so I was the first person with a truly serious communicable disease to be treated in that unit. But they maintained their preparations those 12 years, and they were ready to, to use their skills they had been practicing. And because my return to the United States required approval of the United States government and the involvement of the State Department and every level of the United States government, um, I think the CDC knew about that unit at Emory. And so they asked the, the director of the unit, would you be willing to receive a patient with Ebola and take care of him? And he said yes. Uh, so my colleague Nancy and I were taken to Atlanta, to Emory. But when my colleague, Dr. Rick, he was the third patient to be brought back to America, he did not go to Emory. They sent him to another hospital in Nebraska uh, that had a similar unit. And there were only a few of those around the country, but they were done in collaboration with government entities for situations like this. Someone was thinking ahead, and, and uh, I'm very thankful to those people who, who prepared for so long. I believe it was on the cover of Time magazine a couple decades ago when some scientist announced that we had ended the age of infectious diseases. He said, with our modern antibiotics, infectious diseases will no longer play a major role in, in the world. Well, we see that he was obviously wrong. Um, not only do we have diseases that are developing bacterial resist or antibiotic resistance, but we have all of these emerging diseases that there's no treatment for. Um, if you can find a way to end all of the infectious diseases in Africa or any continent, I think you will be awarded the Nobel Prize. Uh, and it's something we should strive towards. But like you, like you pointed out, it is no easy task and there's no single solution that will end all of those diseases. Thank you for your question. Asante sana. I, I have faith in God. And, and when I read in the Bible the teachings of Jesus, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. 
and I take those teachings very seriously. And and it it was that it was those teachings that I hear as a calling on my life to love my neighbor. And and someone asked Jesus one time, "Who is my neighbor?" They wanted to know how to how to interpret that law, that that requirement to love your neighbor. They said, "Who is my neighbor?" And so he told a story of of a man who was attacked by robbers on a road and he was beaten and stripped and left for dead and he tells the story of some some people walking by who ignored the man they didn't want to get involved they didn't want to endanger themselves and then he says a, a third person came by and saw the man on the side of the road and had compassion on him and he picked the man up put him on his own donkey took him to an inn and, and bandaged his wounds and paid the innkeeper and said, when I return from my trip, business trip, I'll pay you back for anything else you've had to spend on the man. And then Jesus' question to the man who had asked him the question was, who was a neighbor to that man in need? He didn't answer the question of who is my neighbor Instead, he turned the question around and said, to whom should I be a neighbor? And it's to the person in need. And, and I, I think that when you, if, you, if you seek to, to live out that teaching and follow him, it, it changes not only your life, it changes the world. It was my small effort to do that, that that landed me an invitation to speak to all of you in a country I've never been to, to be the host of your dean who's honored me with, with this opportunity. It's not because I'm a great humanitarian. It's not because I um, am the best physician in the world. I was not at the top of my class in medical school. But I care about my patients because Jesus said I should love my neighbors and my patients are my neighbors. And so I think those little things have a very big impact uh, far beyond the, the one person you help.